Hey guys, welcome back. Skidstone Series, episode 27. Topic today, you know, I'm always honest about this. A filler topic, complete waste of time. Highly recommend you skip the video, but it should be a quick one either way. Numerical integration, we'll go through two different ways to implement this. One is the trapezoidal method. The other is Gaussian quadrature. Both pretty cool in their own right, but uh, a bit of a speed run for me in this video. So let's get into it. Integration, what is it? Basically, it's finding the area between a function and the x-axis or between functions, perhaps. Um, and usually, to do it symbolically speaking, you have to do these dumb math tricks and manipulations to make it work. And as a result, there has been no productive use case found for integration as of the current month. However, if they find one, which they won't, I will amend the video in the description below. So check that out if there's any changes. Um, but yeah, basically you get the signed area between this pink line and the white line um, in red here. And this is how you you draw that out, you know, integral from A to B, f, f of x dx. Now that's great, but how can you enslave a computer to do that analysis for you? Um, a couple options. By the way, there's more than just this, but here are my five ideas. Option one, why don't we render that function as a bitmap? and then count the pixels, or as an SVG, and count the pixels, and then use that, and then relate that to the area. Good idea. Uh, option two, better idea. Uh, how about we render as a bitmap, and then print it out on my printer, and then get my toner capacity decreased, and then relate that to the, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I would do that, my printer's broken though, unfortunately. Option three, we could just guess. Honestly, um, zero is a pretty good guess if you ask me, right? Area could be negative infinity or it could be positive infinity. Zero is dead center, right? So not a, not a bad guess if you ask me. So just return zero, that's fine. Um, option four, if you really wanted to, you could probably approximate that area as, you know, as some set of geometric primitives that you can get the area of individually. Maybe this is a triangle over here. Maybe this is a circle I mean, that's a square. This is some weird octagon looking thing, right? some trapezoid going on here, maybe another square, maybe a hot air balloon shape over here, I don't know. Yeah, that, that would work. If you can get the areas of each one, add them up, you're all set. Uh, an option five, maybe there's some fancy math tricks that we could work with as well. So we'll stick with option four and five. If my printer worked, we'd add in number two, but unfortunately here, that's where we at. So trapezoid method, what's the idea? You're gonna estimate the area of the function between the function and the x-axis using trapezoids. In this case, I have this really advanced function here, y equals x squared. And so we've got five trapezoids, or really four trapezoids and one triangle at A1. Um, and so you get the area of each, you add them up and you're done. So how does this work? Well, for a trapezoid, it's basically a rectangle on, on drugs. So you get the midpoint or the average side length between left and right. That's this one here multiply that by the base like a rectangle and then you're done. So this part of it gets the average side length. This is the base, you know, easy peasy. Um, and so you do that, you add them up and you're done. In this case, you do that for these five trapezoids, you get 42.5. The exact answer, if you trust these mathematicians, is 41.67 exactly. I'm sure there's no more digits around here, um, but we're pretty close. Not that close, but for five, or actually six function calls, not half bad to be you know a couple percent off like this and so we implement this in the trapezoid method assembly code that we'll talk about in this video at the end um, but yeah that's pretty straightforward there are some opportunities to make this more efficient if you think about it right this side that's the right hand side of a4 but the left hand side of a5 and so maybe you could change this some maybe I don't know to account for the fact that you're reusing that side. Yeah, maybe, could be. I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. Um, so what are some pros and cons of this? So symbolic or analytical integration, you need some either some fancy symbolic toolbox like they have in MATLAB or in Mathematica or in Maple, um, which costs money, unless you pirate the software, which you probably could do, um, or you have to tie up a mathematician, keep them in your basement, feed him crackers. Again, that costs money. The rope isn't cheap, right? And so it's expensive to do this. The trapezoid method is much cheaper because 
you have to just call the function. You call this function six times and you're done. No crackers needed. So good idea. What about number two? The symbolic integration method, you need an actual set of symbols. You can't integrate nothing. You need me to give you this. Uh, but here's a, a secret about society. There are no functions in society. No one's gonna email you a function and say, integrate this. That's not real, dude. They, in real life, there's no functions, it's just data. And so you may have a sensor data you wanna integrate, which you can do with trapezoid method, but you can't, you don't need a expression to integrate that. Also, you can do black boxes. So if you had a black box to integrate, you could do so. So if you had some finite element analysis software that takes 10 minutes to run and gives you a single quantity output, you can integrate that, numerically speaking, with this method without having any analytical expressions. So that's a, you know, an also advantage. The only problem with the estimates is that it doesn't give you an exact answer without having a lot of trapezoids. Um, you can see here, even with five trapezoids, we were still not that close to the exact answer. Whereas you can get the exact answer pretty quickly with a symbolic analytical integral. Can we do better? The answer is obviously yes. And for that, one way we can get do better for certain functions is Gaussian quadrature. And I'm not going to get into all the details here. You can check out the Wikipedia page. But basically, you convert the integral into a sum of function evaluations that are weighted by a certain a set of weights. And so for endpoints and end weights for your estimate, you can get an exact integral for polynomials of order 2 and minus 1 or less. So for a cubic, with just two points, you can exactly get the area of a cubic polynomial integral. So how does it work? Well, you have this integral here. So from negative one to one, those are your bounds of the integration. Uh, you sum up the weights times the function evaluation. So you have n weights, wi, and n weights, or n points, x sub i. Uh, so yeah, that's how that works. And then the weights and the points, they come from some Legendre polynomial stuff, too hard for me. So we're just going to preload. And also it's too hard to compute every time. If you think about it, if every time you wanted an integral, you have to you know, do all this fancy Legendre polynomial stuff, it would take forever. And so by preloading all the data in a table, you're able to very quickly compute these estimates of the integral. And so yeah, the weights and the points themselves, we're gonna preload them as a table. And you may notice that the bounds of integration are from negative one to one, however, uh, we can obviously translate any bounds to those bounds just by adjusting our function, right? So if our bounds are negative 10 to 10, we can adjust, we can scale our inputs and scale the function accordingly to get the bounds to negative one to one to work in this way. And so here's how that works. Basically, if you think about it, let's say your bounds are negative 10 to 10. That means your range is 20, whereas the range of this function here, this integral here is two. And so this expression here, that converts your range, so B minus A, to the Gaussian quadrature range of two. Similarly, you have that here. So you're scaling both the input vet, input point as well as the output by that domain change, which is easy to do. And then this over here, that's the shift. So the midpoint of one and negative one is zero, but the midpoint of A to B is just a plus b over two. And so you have to shift your point by that. So basically, if you think about it, this just converts the Gaussian points into your points in your domain. And then this converts the range, or converts the, yeah, the, the resultant value back to the size that you want it to be. So yeah, that's how that works. And here's some more example, more details. So here are the points and weights for n equals one to five. And so for a single point, um, with evaluating the function at x equals zero with a weight of two, that gives you the estimate of your integral. And that would be valid for two n minus one, n being one, so that's one, right? This gives you the exact value of a linear integral. And then this would give you a cubic and so on. And of course, uh, n equals five, this this n would give you the ability to estimate with five points and five weights, which are all tabulated here, a polynomial of order nine, which is way more than you'd ever need because most things in real life are 
cubic at the highest in, in my experience, maybe quadratic most of the time, cubic sometimes, maybe quartic one in a million years. So yeah, that's pretty good. And so you can see here, here's a random cubic polynomial, uh, 7x cubed, whatever. The trapezoid method with two points, right? The two endpoints are being evaluated. You can see that gives you a, an absolutely horrible estimate of the area, right? If this is the zero line, this is not even close to the area of the polynomial integral, right? However, the Gaussian one with two points, these two random points at negative root one over three, positive root one over three, you get those two values of the function, multiply those values each by one in this case, add them together, you get the exact integral. It's pretty powerful stuff, right? And so, yeah, it's basically a cheat code that you can use to evaluate the integral of polynomials of, you know, decent order. And of course, if you wanted to, you could extend this list or you could compute these values formulaically, right? You can get the, if you really wanted to, you could get the points and weights for a polynomial, you know, or n equals like 100, but I'm not sure why you would, but you could do that. You could go through and figure out the, the weights and the, the xi's for any order, right? If you really wanted to. We're not gonna do that though. Um, so what is, what are our examples today? We have two, one for each method. Let's get into it. So here you can see those two examples. Um, let's go into the actual code first. Lib math integration. And so here is the trapezoid method. So what do I have set up here? So basically, it's a function. You pass in in RDI the function pointer. So we're going to pass in some polynomial or some some other function that you want to evaluate. And that function, the only thing about that function is it has to take in an input in x and m zero, and it returns its output also in x and m zero. So let's say you had y equals x squared as your function that you want to integrate or estimate the integral of. You that function has to be set up in a way that it doesn't affect any other registers but x and m zero. So you have to push them all to the stack, pop them all off afterwards. Um, but yeah, it takes in x in x and m zero, squares it, and returns that back in x and m zero. That's how that would work. But then you also have to pass in in RSI the number of steps. So again, five steps was a decent estimate, but 100 would have been better, right? And so you pass in the number of steps you want to do, number of trapezoids in RSI. And then you pass in the bounds. So x of m zero is the lower bound, and one is the upper bound. And that will estimate the area for you, no problem. How does this work? Well, first things first, I push all the registers to the stack that I'm not going to affect. Um, I don't want to affect it. And then I put them all back at the end down here. And then what happens? So basically, you can see here, we are computing the step size. So we're taking the upper and lower bound, dividing that by the number of steps. You can see we convert from a integer to a double with this uh, instruction here. So we divide by that, giving our step size in XMM2. Then we have a running sum that we track in XMM4. And then we basically call left-hand side, we evaluate with left-hand side of our trapezoid. And then we evaluate with the right-hand side of the trapezoid. And then we constantly recompute the area of each trapezoid. And then we shift the right-hand side to the left-hand side for the next one and just add up the sums as we're going. And so a very simple process. I'm sure you could figure out a, a similar or perhaps better way to do this. So that's that. Now, what about the quadrature? And so in this case, it's in many ways easier because there's less things to do, right? You don't have to do a hundred trapezoids. You only have to do two uh, function calls, right? For order two estimate. Um, but it's a little bit different in how it works. So in this case, same inputs pretty much pass in the um, function pointer in RDI. The same function has to, you know, have inputs and outputs in x of m zero only pass in the, the order in rsi so you want order order four you pass in four for rsi and then the two bounds in x of m zero and x of m one and again it returns the area estimate in x of m zero and this works for polynomials but it can also give you a not half bad estimate for other things as well but i would use this exclusively for polynomials if you could so again First things first, you save the registers to the stack. At the end, you pop them off back. 
but I will say while I'm down here, I'll show you what's going on. So we have preloaded, you know, before compile time, literally in the binary, all of the points and weights for orders one, two, three, four, and five. So they're all saved here as 20 point numbers, right? Um, you can see here's your plus and minus square root of three, right? Here's your weights of one for the order, order two estimate. Um, the challenging thing is now that although we're not responsible for computing these values with the whatever we're doing to you know get the formulas to work, we do have to actually figure out where these are in the table, right? So you you pass in an RSI the order that you want to use for the estimate order three. Now you have to figure out where in my table is the order three points and weights. How does that work? Well, not too bad but you do have to do some math to figure that out. And so that's what this is doing right here. It's basically figuring out how many bytes am I offset from that points and weights label, this address in memory, how far are we from this? Like say I wanna do an order three polynomial, uh, order three uh, estimate, I should say, how, how many bytes between this address and this address and this address and this address. So compute those two things, and then at the end of that, basically you have in RAX the pointer to the start of the weights, and then you have in RDX the pointer to the start of the points. So yeah, that's how that works. Then you just loop through, evaluate the um, polynomial or the function at those points, multiply by the weight, compute the running sum here, XMM4, and then uh, and you're done, right? At the end, we do have to shift. So one thing you have to do though, remember, is you have to constantly convert back to the the range negative one to one in order to use this. And so we, we can see here, there's some instructions that help you relate the input x sub i's into the function x sub i's, right? Convert the bounds negative one to one to your particular bounds, x of zero to x of one. And so there's some, function handling for that here. But yeah, besides that, it's pretty straightforward. You literally only have like, this is your entire loop, right? From here to here. That does all the, the lifting for this algorithm. So let's now look at the examples themselves. So example A, trapezoid method, let's just run it. So if I run this, you can see that's the function I'm integrating at the top. Uh, y is negative 4x cubed plus 3x squared plus 1 half x minus 51. And you can see here are, are the estimates for the area with a different, with a variable number of trapezoids for the estimate. And so with one trapezoid, we have a horrible estimate. It's the wrong sign completely of 240. And then as you get to higher amount of trapezoids, we get a better and better estimate. And of course, you don't have to go through a loop like this. You could start off at 25. You don't have to do one, two, three, four in order. However, one advantage to doing it in order like this is you can get like kind of a convergence history, right? You can figure out, well, hey, I was pretty, here's my estimate for all these levels of trapezoids, you know, one, two, three, four, all the way to 100. But, you know, we got close enough, I would say at 16. That was close enough for my liking. And so from now on, we're going to stop at 16. And so there is some benefits to going through and doing a, a whole bunch of these with different step sizes, for example, but you don't have to do that. So how does this work? Let's look at the code. So includes are very simple. All we have is the trapezoid method as well as some printing stuff to see our output. So very minimal. And here's the function I was talking about before. So this function has to take inputs and return outputs in XM zero, but not touch any other registers. And so here you can see this function just computes that polynomial expression um, and it puts the value back in X minimum zero. Then how does this work? Well, we just loop through, we print out at, at the beginning the integral itself. Then we loop through, print out some stuff, run the method, print out the answer. And we do that from, you can see R rate of one all the way to R rate of 25. And you can see for the trapezoid method function call, we pass in the two bounds, x minus zero, x minus one, put the function pointer in RDI, and then the number of trapezoids in RSI. So let's change this really quick to a bigger number. Let's do 1,000. Well, that's not 1,000, that's 100. And then run this. You can see 
we've now approached negative 260, and that's the exact answer, by the way. But you can see we were pretty close at 25, but we were not there, and actually, we're still not there, technically speaking, right? And we'll never exactly be there, unless by chance, but probably not for this particular polynomial. Um, so we're close, but we're not exactly there. Now, what about example B? This one is the quadrature. And remember, this is a cubic function, so we should be able to get this in think about 2n minus 1. So order 2 estimate would be capable of estimating an exact integral for order 3 polynomial. So if I run this, you can see the same polynomial for the you know, function. Order 1, wrong answer. Order 2, right answer. 3, 4, and 5, all right answer the exact answer. So if you think about this, look what we have on the screen here. For a, a thousand trapezoids, a thousand, which is a thousand and one function calls, best case, right? We're still not right with our estimate. But with two function calls for the Gaussian quadrature, we get the exact answer. And that, that's true for up to a million. You have a million trapezoids, you'd still not be the exact answer. You'd be close, be very close. But with only two function calls, you can get the exact answer. Is that not powerful? And this is not like, you know, I didn't like put this in there. That's literally just based off the numbers on the table, the points and the weights, you get the exact integral of 260 negative there. How does that work in the code? Let's take a look. Much the same thing. It's pretty much just plug and play. We just changed the integration method from trapezoids to quadrature. Oops, I uh, fixed that. That's bad documentation there. Quadrature. Again, same polynomial, um, the same printing. Only difference being is that you're not passing in the number of trapezoids, you're passing in the order of the polynomial, we've only encoded the weights and the points up to order five. You could expand that. You wanna do up to 10, 20, 30, be my guest. Um, but yeah, we only loop from R8 of one down to R8 of five. But if you wanna add more, be my guest. But yeah, so pretty cool if you ask me, you're able to get an exact integral of a polynomial expression with very few function calls using Gaussian quadrature. So, and by the way, a lot of things in the real world are either polynomials or can be very closely approximated as such. And so there's a lot of applications for this if you're in the business of computing integrals, which is a waste of time, let's be honest. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. Have a great day. See you in the next video.